Hey folks, we're going to finish our last uh, little talk and discussion, discussion topic on uh, the nervous system and talk about the peripheral nervous system. So um, this is where we're going to start today and hopefully we will complete it all. Now, we talked a little bit before, the, the only thing that, in, that comprises the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Once that nerve leaves the spinal cord and becomes a peripheral nerve, okay, or, or a nerve root as it as it's characterized as it comes out of the spinal cord, it's part of the peripheral nervous system, okay? Uh, and what do peripheral nerves carry? Well, first of all, they carry somatic nerves to skin and muscle. Afferent fibers are the sensory fibers. They're going to go upwards towards the brain to bring signals back to the brain. And efferent fibers or motor fibers are going to take signals from the brain and send them on down. Again, going through all those things we talked about in all those basal ganglia and the cerebellum and modulating and all kinds of stuff we've talked about in previous videos, okay? Also, the, the uh, peripheral nervous system has autonomic nerves, which are those involuntary nerves we talked about. We still have to get a nerve supply to the viscera, to the, to the heart, to the lungs, to the stomach, to the intestines, to the bladder, everything. We need those, those uh, nerves that are going to go there. Those are involuntary. So they're part of the um, uh, peripheral nervous system, but part of the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Um, again, a lot of these come, some of these will come directly from the brain stem or the hypothalamus. Uh, and we know we talked before about sympathetic, which has a tendency to uh, speed things up as compared to parasympathetic, which has a tendency to slow things down with the notable exception, like we've mentioned before, of the uh, GI tract, which the parasympathetic makes things work better, where the sympathetic slows it down, just the opposite. Now, what really comprises the peripheral nervous system? Um, there are actually a couple things that we do have besides that nerve. And again, I should mention also, we talked about this in, way back at the beginning of the nervous system videos, and uh, the nerves have a combination of different fibers, uh, afferent sensory fibers, afferent motor fibers, and a lot of them with autonomic type fibers that will also be intermingled in a single nerve. What comprises the different types of nerves? First of all, the first set of, of peripheral nerves we have are what are called the cranial nerves. Now, we've briefly alluded to these before in one way, shape, or form. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and these originate directly from the brain. And as we saw when we looked at the skull, they head out through those small little foramen in multiple places on the base of the skull. Uh, jugular foramen, uh, stylomastoid foramen, uh, a, a number of different holes where there's a foramen ovale, there's a number of different foramens or holes on the base of the skull where these cranial nerves will come out. Talked about the olfactory nerve coming out, going through the cribriform plate through those little holes in the ethmoid bone to go to the roof of the nose and going through, and the optic foramen for the optic nerve. And I'll talk about each one of those nerves very briefly uh, to follow this. Besides that, in our last uh, video uh, I talk, we talked about spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves which come out of the spinal cord, which either uh, exit between the vertebrae uh, that we have in the uh, adjacent uh, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae, but in the sacrum, remember we talked about those large holes with a frame in, in, the, in the sacrum, and spinal nerves will come out of there as well. So we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves all in all, you know, uh, and one, one half the pair goes to the right side, one half the pair goes to the left side, okay? Uh, let's talk a little about those cranial nerves, because even though they're small, but they're mighty, okay? They're part of the peripheral nervous system, not part of the central nervous system, because they have left the brain now. Uh, however, they do originate directly from the brain. These nerves have their origin in the brain uh, and then come directly out, as compared to all the spinal nerves, which actually start in the brain, go down the spinal cord, and exit at a certain point, okay? Uh, so uh, there are, as I mentioned, there are 12 pairs, and let's briefly go over what each of those 12 pairs, of pairs are. The first cranial nerve is called the olfactory nerve. And the olfactory nerve comes from olfactory bulbs, which are on the anterior aspect of the brain. They're on the, on the bottom. All these cranial nerves are on the bottom of the brain, okay? They're difficult. You can't get to them from the top. They have to, they're on the bottom of the brain. So olfactory nerve actually is quite, pretty large, okay? And uh, what happens is they, they, they come up from what are called the olfactory bulbs at the anterior aspect of the brain. They head forward to that cribriform plate just on both sides of the galley and the ethmoid bone and pass down through those small holes which we pointed out in the lab. So that's called the olfactory nerve, or cranial nerve one. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve. We talked about that before. That's from the thalamus. I don't know why that's spelled, T-H-A-L-M-U-S, from the thalamus, and it's involved in vision. We talked about how 
uh, the eye, at the back of the eye, the back of the uh, eyeball itself, there's, a, there's a, the nerve that comes out, which is the second cranial nerve, the optic nerve. As it goes to that optic frame in, in the deep portion of the orbit, again, part of those fibers will cross, go to the other side, part of them go straight back, and they're, they're, they finally go back to the area of the thalamus. And from that point, they're rerouted from the thalamus to the um, uh, occipital lobe of the brain where the visual centers are like we talked about before. And if I'm looking at the uh, olfactory nerve, we're talking about this one up here. Whoops, is that, well, you can't want to see it. You'll see it, you can pick it out on the, on, the, on the chart. The large one that's going forward and the optic nerve we know has a cross. The place where the optic nerve crosses, by the way, is called the optic chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M, the optic chiasm. Op uh, cranial nerve three is called the ocular motor nerve, okay? And the ocular motor, ocular motor nerve comes from the brain, okay? Uh, from the midbrain area, and it's involved in the eye movements, um, and also pupillary dilation. Um, what happens is there are six eye muscles, okay? Uh, there's a superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, and lateral rectus, as well as a superior oblique and an inferior oblique. And I used to tell my PA students and other medical students, they can remember that all of the muscles of the eye, okay, all those six muscles of the eye are supplied by the oculomotor nerve with the exception of LR6, SO4. Sounds like a chemi chemistry uh, formula. LR6 stands for the lateral rectus, which is supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, and the SO stands for superior oblique, which is supplied by four. All the other ones are supplied by cranial nerve three. Also, it's involved with uh, the, the pupils, okay? What cranial nerve does, three does, is it constricts the pupils. It constricts the pupils. What happens is when they always, you know, show these pictures where somebody gets gets uh, uh, killed and they zoom in on their eyes and you see the pupils start to dilate. What really happens is because of the injury to the cranial nerve three, we can't keep that pupil constricted and as a result, it starts to dilate. And that dilation is because now that oculomotor nerve, which constricts the pupil, no longer works, okay? And that's what we see. It's a late finding in head injuries, but the, eye, the pupil will dilate simply because the oculomotor nerve will keep the uh, uh, pupil uh, constricted and when the ocular nerve stop, or when with decreased uh, stimulation, the pupil will dilate because of less constriction power of that of that cranial nerve of the ocular motor nerve. And uh, and when you're in a dark area, your pupils get large. And the reason why is the ocular motor nerve sends out less signals, and the pupils will dilate. Okay, so that's the ocular motor nerve. Cranial nerve four is the trochlear nerve. That also comes from the midbrain, like we talked about before. And that's also involved in the eye movements, but only for, you know, what's the big hoopla about this? It actually supplies one eye muscle, and that's superior oblique, and that's going to the SO4 that we talked about. So that's the oculomotor nerve and the trochlear nerve. And if we're looking at the oculomotor nerve and the, and the trochlear nerve, uh, here's the oculomotor nerve right down in here, and here's the trochlear nerve, that little bitty little thing right there and right Oh, you, I didn't have my thing on. Anyway, here's the oculomotor nerve right here and here, and here's the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve four, right there and right there. Okay, I'm never going to ask you to pick these out of a out of a um, chart. I think that's crazy, but anyway, I'm just showing you. Where, okay, uh, uh, cranial nerve five. It's a really important nerve. It's called the trigeminal nerve. Okay, uh, and, and what happens is cranial nerve five does a lot of things. Okay. Um, is the cranial nerve fiber, the trigeminal nerve, comes from the pons and supplies the muscles of mastication. Well, mastication means chewing, and the muscles of mastication will we 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 actually uh, talk uh, we'll talk about in lab is the temporalis. If you clench your jaw, you feel how the temporal muscle, how the temporal area gets it's tight. That's a temporalis which pulls the jaw up. Remember, it attaches to that coronoid process of the mandible as well as the masseter, which is this big jaw muscle right here. There are two other muscles that are muscles of mastication. Uh, there's called the medial and lateral pterygoids, and guess where they come from? They come from the pterygoid process of the sphenoid, and basically that moves the jaw side to side and forward to back, okay? So that's what it does. It supplies the, those four muscles of mastication, the temporalis, the masseter, and the medial and lateral pterygoids on each side, okay? What it also does is it provides all the sensations of the face. When you touch your forehead, above your eyes, around your nose, your mouth, and stuff like that, which again, with the COVID-19, COVID you shouldn't be doing a whole lot. If you touch your face, that sensation is perceived by that trigeminal nerve. And that's what gives the sensation and sends that signal back to the brain. Also, we talked about this a couple times in lab, brain freeze. What happens is the trigeminal nerve also supplies the roof of the mouth as well as the meninges. And everybody knows the meninges are the coverings. 
So what happens is when you're eating something cold, it freezes or it gets cold, the roof of the mouth, which stimulates the trigeminal nerve. And because the trigeminal nerve also goes to the, to the meninges, it's called referred pain. The meninges are perfectly fine. They're not cold, nothing like that. But that pain seems like it's there because it stimulates the trigeminal nerve in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the roof of the mouth and the back of the nose. And so that's what happens. All the sinuses are also, the membranes that cover all the sinuses are also supplied in sensory fibers by the trigeminal nerve. Okay, and that's what the trigeminal nerve does. Muscles of mastication and the sensory fibers of the face as well as the roof of the mouth, the meninges, and all the sinuses and stuff like that. Uh, the abducens, which is cranial nerve six, comes from the pons, and that's also involved in eye movements. And again, no big deal, lateral rectus. That's that LR6 that we talked about before, okay? And that's the abducens nerve, and you know, not much else that that does. So if I look at where these things are, you'll actually see here's the trigeminal nerve, which look at that Waffen nerve. That's a huge nerve. There's multiple different branches that goes lots of different places as cranial nerve five. And here's cranial nerve six sitting right there. Okay. And that's cranial nerve five, cranial nerve. Trigeminal nerve is a huge nerve. Okay. And really, really important. Um, and uh, sometimes um, when people, uh, this is another thing too, is sometimes when people have uh, 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 herpes simplex or, uh, excuse me, herpes zoster, which is shingles. Sometimes the, the zoster is a virus that sits in the nerve root, and sometimes it involves a nerve root, which calls the tri, which involves sometimes the trigeminal nerve. So people have persistent pain along a course, uh, one of the branches of that trigeminal nerve, and it, it could be a really problem for a long time. So anyway, that's cranial nerves five and cranial nerve six. We're halfway there. Cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve. The facial nerve is also very important. Everything I do with my face, all the muscles in my face are basically supplied by the facial nerve. If I wrinkle my forehead, if I move my jaw, uh, move my puff my puff my cheeks out, that's that buccinator we talked about, you know, or that we'll talk about a little bit more. If I you know, squint my eyes and stuff like that, that close my eyes real tight, that's all the facial nerve, okay? And the facial nerve supplies what are called muscles of facial expression. There are only three things you have to worry about, three nerves that you have to worry about in regards to the face. Number one, to move the face, okay. Um, and, and all the, uh, you know, most of the facial expressions is supplied by the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. Muscles of mastication, uh, uh, basically the temporalis, the masseter, and the pterygoids, cranial nerve five. The only other one you have to even think about is the eyelid. The upper eyelid opens up or pulls up the upper eyelid, and that's by cranial nerve three, which is the oculomotor. Every other muscle is either going to be the facial, facial nerve, muscles of expression, or muscle of facial expression, or the trigeminal nerve, which is basically muscles of mastication or chewing. Okay, so that's the facial nerve. Quite, a, and people when they have Bell's palsy, what happens is the facial nerve comes out of the skull, a little hole right by the stylomastoid region, comes out through a little hole, and sometimes and when people have what's called a Bell's palsy, that nerve gets swollen inside that hole, and they get a drooping on the jaw, and they can't close their eyes. Why? Because the, the raising of the eyelid is by cranial nerve three, ocular motor, but the closing of the eye, by what's called the orbicularis oculi, which goes around the eye, which we'll talk about in lab uh, this week, um, or, you know, the week, for first week back, uh, basically is closed, that's supplied by cranial nerve seven. So those people have a difficult time closing their eye, their mouth will droop, and they get food caught between their cheek and their, and their gums because that buccinator, which is a muscle we'll learn about in lab, it, it, it holds, it holds the, the cheek close to the teeth so I don't get things caught in between there. Cranial nerve eight is called the vesticular co the cochlear nerve or auditory nerve. This also comes from the area of the pons. And it's involved in hearing as well as balance. So in other words, a hearing, the nerve, when we finally stimulate the, 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 the nerve cells in the inner ear, it sends a signal to the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular cochlear nerve, auditory nerve. It sends it to the brain so I could hear in the temporal lobe region of the brain like we talked about before. As well as inside the ear are small canals. Circular canals are called semicircular canals, which are important with balance. And they send a neural signal to the brain to give me an idea of what position my head is in space, okay? And that's the facial nerve and the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve or ocular, and ocular, ocular nerve. And if we look right here, here's the facial nerve. Again, the facial nerve, if we come down in here, it's sort of stuck right about here. Facial nerve stuck right there. And we have our vestibular cochlear nerve or acoustic nerve or auditory nerve, both acoustic or auditory sits right in there, okay? So and that's cranial nerve uh, uh, 
uh, seven or eight. It's, it's sort of ironic. I was just uh, going out and picking up supplies before they have this total shutdown. And I met an old friend, uh, another physician that was in uh, Walmart. And he was talking about, we were talking about uh, canceling elective surgeries. And uh, uh, he was telling that his a patient who basically is upset because he had an elective procedure to be able to, to do surgery on an acoustic neuroma. And sometimes people will, they'll get a little uh, swelling or fibrosis around the acoustic nerve and their hearing goes down as well as it causes problems in regards to the balance and equilibrium. Cranial nerve nine is called the glossopharyngeal nerve. That also comes from the pons in the medulla region, the medulla oblongata, and supplies the muscles of swallowing. When I, when I swallow, my soft palate goes up. What does that? The glossopharyngeal nerve. When you when the doc puts his puts a tongue blade in your mouth and says say ah, he's watching for the uh, for the for the uh, uh, soft palate to rise to tell them that the glossopharyngeal nerve is intact. Okay, also lets them see the back of the pharynx a lot better. So it supplies the muscles uh, of swallowing and also supplies a lot of the portions of a taste. Now not all taste is supplied by cranial nerve uh, nine, but a lot of it is. So that's the glossopharyngeal nerve. Cranial nerve 10, I could probably talk like about three weeks on that. It's from the medulla oblongata. It's called the vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve I mentioned multiple times so far. Vagus means the wanderer. and provides motor supply to uh, so many organs and viscera, almost everything, okay? Um, it's involved in so many body processes. It's involved in heart rate. Most of the fibers of the, of the vagus nerve are parasympathetic, so it has a tendency when it fires to slow down the heart rate. Uh, blood pressure regulation, uh, digestion. Again, I mentioned that what happens is that vagus nerve goes to the stomach. And when I smell food or, or, or taste food, it sends that vagus nerve sends a signal down to my stomach. And there's certain cells called parietal cells in the stomach that secrete acid. So it causes those parietal cells to secrete acid. Also, that peristalsis or those squeezing motions, they give the intestine, guess what supplies it? Well, basically, it's originated from the vagus nerve. Uh, uh, urination, uh, what, what actually causes the bladder to sort of contract and squeeze, guess what nerve that is? That's the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is one huge whopper nerve that does a lot of stuff that goes almost everywhere. Nobody's left out. It's an equal opportunity um, uh, employer employing every, every organ in the body just about. And that's called the vagus nerve. Super important, okay? And if I look at the, uh, at the uh, 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 glossopharyngeal nerve, you know, we're talking about like right down in here. And then that vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, is right next to it right there, okay? And both of those go out the jugular foramen with the, with the jugular vein, where that, where that uh, venous sinus met the jugular vein in that jugular foramen. Both of those nerves will go out that jugular foramen with the, with the uh, 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 jugular vein, okay? So that's a little bit about the uh, cranial nerves 9 and 10, 11 and 12. Accessory nerve. The accessory nerve is a real small nerve, and basically it's from the medulla oblongata. It's also smiley involved with swallowing, but the most important thing it is, it's involved with shrugging the shoulders. It brings the shoulders up this way, okay? So when, the, when, they put, when someone is testing you, doing a physical, they put their hands on your shoulder and say, shrug your shoulders, guess what they're checking? They're checking the accessory nerve. So next time you go for a physical, and the doc does it, says, oh, how's my accessory nerve? And they'll be really impressed, okay? But that's that. Uh, that's the cranial nerve 11 of the accessory nerve. Cranial nerve 12 is called the hypoglossal. Hypo means below, glossal means tongue. And this actually comes through the tongue. There's a left side and a left side and supplies the muscle of the tongue with movements that are also involved. So therefore, it's involved in things, speech and swallowing. Uh, for me to swallow, what, the t what you make a bowl of food, the tongue will actually push up and pushes the food back to the area of the posterior portion of the throat, the pharynx, which then causes a stimulation of nine and 10, which causes that, that the soft palate to rise, seal off the back of the nose, and pushes things to the back and allows the muscles in the back of the throat to actually constrict, to actually squeeze the food down the back of the throat towards the esophagus. Um, well, what the hypoglossal nerve does besides that also is involved in speech. So what happens is when I speech, my tongue does all kinds of crazy things inside my mouth. Sometimes it doesn't do what I tell it to, and, and that helps me to form my speech, okay? When the doc does this and says, okay, stick out your tongue, and you stick your tongue straight out, it should come out straight because there's a nerve on the left side and a nerve on the right side. If both of them are working, the tongue comes out straight. If this side is working and this side doesn't, it, 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 so if the right side's working, this side over here, which is the left on the screen, but the right side and the left side's not, you say, and, the doc, and you say, doc, stick your, they'd actually you stick your tongue out, it'll go like this. Because the tongue will be pushed out by the side that works, and it's not pushed at all. So it, it'll go to the opposite side. And so anyway, that's a little about the uh, hypoglossal nerve and the accessory nerve, okay? 
And again, if I'm looking where they're, they're at the very back, okay? So basically when we're talking back in here, uh, here's the accessory nerve sitting right there, and here's the hypoglossal nerve sitting right there. Hypoglossal nerve goes to its own little track, the hypoglossal foramen, okay? You don't have to remember that. But that's a little about the canine nerves. Spinal nerves, let me mention a couple things about the spinal nerves. Again, we said that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerve, one for each spinal segment, which includes not just the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae, but also the sacrum and down towards the coccyx. Coccyx. They're mixed nerve. They have both motor and sensory components to it. There's very few nerves that would have a single type of a, of a fiber in there. They're almost all mixed, if not all mixed. Uh, and again, what happens is they arise at regular intervals from the cord and they go through that intervertebral foramen out the sides between the vertebrae, adjacent vertebrae, like we saw in the model in the lab. Okay. Basically, they just name them according to the spinal segments based on location. They have eight cervical because there's one above and one below. So there's eight cervical, C1 through C8, 12 thoracic, T1 through T12, 5 lumbar, you know, L1 through L5, 5 sacral. S1 through S5, and one coccygeal, which is coccygeal CO1, okay? So basically, those are the spinal nerves, okay? And again, if we look here, this is a uh, thing we showed on the last, showing the level of the spinal cord, and at each segment, a spinal nerve is going to come out between each of the vertebrae that goes out. And what's going to happen is that nerve is just coming out haphazardly. It's gathered bundles of nerves from the spinal cord, and if they're going to go to the arm, those nerves are all recruited at the same time. They come out a nerve. Okay. And I'll talk a little about that very briefly in just a second. So that's that. Um, again, there, there, it's the, the, there's a communication between the spinal cord and the brain and the nerves going to a particular area of the body or a viscera. Okay. And that's what these spinal nerves are. We know that what happens is the, sprint, the brain and spinal cord are the central nervous system, but once it needs, leaves the spinal cord, it's part of the peripheral nervous system because we have to get that nerve fiber to wherever it's gonna go and everything in the body is innervated, okay? There are two actual bundles of nerves that leave or axons that leave um, the spinal cord and they're called roots, okay? And, and what happens is, uh, uh, there's called the uh, posterior or dorsal root, okay? And I'll show you a diagram. The posterior or dorsal root only has sensory axons in it. So it gets input from the skin, the muscle, internal organs, and it's headed on its way to the central nervous system, okay? Uh, there's also a little area on, the, on, this, on this posterior root where it looks swollen, and that's called the dors dorsal root ganglion. It has the sensory or cell bodies of the sensory nerve and so that are sort of like um, uh, intermittent or inter intermediate neurons between going up to the brain as well as coming from the rest of the body. The anterior portion is called the ventral root or anterior root, and that's only with motor neurons. And it goes, and those are leaving the spinal cord to go to effector organs or cells. And let me just show you a diagram of this. So here's my spinal cord. Here's my spinal cord right here. This would be posterior or dorsal back here. This area right here would be anterior. I'm putting A here. Hard to draw with this thing. And here's posterior up in here. And though, so this nerve that comes out this way is is sensory. This is, this is, these are cell bodies. So this is a ganglion right here, and it's called the dorsal root ganglion. So the, so, so the sensory input is coming in through this way, okay? And into that, into that dorsal root ganglion, it comes in here. Now, this shows a, sort of like a reflex arc, going from sensory to motor. What happens is, in, motor these, in many of these cases, this nerve is gonna actually send a track that's gonna go up towards the brain. In most cases, the fiber is gonna go up towards the brain and not make an arc that way, okay? They'll go directly up towards the brain. This area right here, leaving right here and going out through there would be called my motor nerve. That's the motor nerve. So this is my anterior or ventral uh, root, and this is my posterior or dorsal root uh, going out the back. Sen sensory motor, okay? And that's what we see. And then finally, we end up with a nerve out here. That long nerve comes out here like that. And guess what it is? It's a mixture of sensory nerves going towards the central nervous system and a mixture of motor nerves going out, okay? There's a bunch of strings hanging out of it, okay? And, and let me just get rid of this so we can see it a little bit better here. Okay, get rid of all these little marks, okay. And basically this is the same thing. So here's the dorsal area, here's posterior back in here, here's anterior up in here. And then, so this is my posterior root right here. What fibers are those? And immediately you should have said sensory. And what fibers are these? Immediately you should have said motor. And what happens is they eventually join out here. Fibers from the sensory are coming this way, fibers from motor are going that way, and as a result, this is what we call my spinal nerve coming out between the two adjacent vertebrae, 
okay and that's just a spot on earth where it's going to go hey it goes everywhere you know it's all over the place wherever it wants to go wherever it needs to go that's where the spinal nerve goes okay it goes to multiple places every and frequently muscles we talked about how the how the the, the, the nerve innervates the muscle well now it's coming out that do, that spinal uh, nerve and it'll divide divide it to various branches and i'll mention that just a second here you know after the um the, the they pass through the intervertebral frame and again they divide divide to rami dorsal posterior ramus again and that sometimes divides into deep muscles of the skin dorsal surface of the trunk and the ventral or anterior ravus which goes to the uh, uh, upper and lower extremity limbs and stuff like that but i won't worry about that too much uh, so the peripheral nerves are basically a network of nerves that provide innervation to all body segments this is a small diagram please don't sit there and you know stay up until four o'clock in the morning memorizing all those we'll talk about a few of those in uh with the lab but uh, this is this is these are just multiple peripheral nerves they go everywhere okay so that's all that and again most nerves are a combination of sensory motor and autonomic fibers inside that particular nerve now what happens is the body was really smart whoever designed this thing was really pretty pretty shrewd when they came up together and they realized that sometimes if i lose one nerve i'll lose the function of a of a whole area okay and they said you know that's not really a good thing we talked about how our, our optic nerve crosses at that optic chiasm so if i lose part of a nerve i could still see in both eyes not perfectly but still see in both eyes what happens is sometimes we have multiple nerves. Once they leave the leave the spinal cord and they head out of spinal nerves, they divide into various branches. Okay, and sometimes these branches say, "Hey, you know what? We have a common uh, function. Let's get together." Okay, and these nerves will come together, and that's called a plexus. Okay, a group of spinal nerves that have communications with different fibers that, have, that go to the same area is called a plexus. Okay, and there are a number of different types of plexus. There's one in the neck called the cervical plexus, which actually takes nerve fibers from C1, C2, C3, C4, and mixes them together. Okay, and that becomes the, the cervical plexus. We have the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus comes in the neck, comes down, and it's deep inside the armpit or in the axillary region, which is actually C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. And these, these nerves will mingle, mix and mingle. So if I actually have a problem with one of the spinal nerves in, in near the back, okay, near the spinal cord, another nerve is going to be there to pick up the slack because they both go to the same place. We have a similar plexus in the lumbar region called the lumbar plexus and one in the sacral region called the sacral plexus and the coccygeal plexus. And they're really sort of very interesting how they mix and mingle, okay, and, and, and move things together. And basically the purpose of them is their redundancy. In other words, if, I, if one nerve goes bad, I still got another nerve from another spinal segment that, that will work, that will help to still to provide some innervation. Another where we have an, another nerve that's really critical where nerves come together is in the neck. I have a spinal root of uh, three, C3, C4, and C5. And parts of those will, will branch off of that spinal nerve and they join together to form one nerve that goes through the thorax over the surface of the heart to the diaphragm and supplies the motor supply to the diaphragm. And that's called the phrenic nerve. Um, when people have a, that's one of the problems when people have a high cervical fracture, if it, if it destroys anywhere above level of C3, the, the, the diaphragm doesn't work because everything below that wouldn't work. And if it's C3, C4, C5 for this phrenic nerve, guess what? Nothing else works below that. So this is just a little about, about nerves and peripheral nerves and plexuses and uh, how they come out the spinal cord and cranial nerves. And hopefully that tidies up uh, all this other stuff that we have with the, uh, with the uh, neurological system and fills you in with everything you probably need to know, at least everything you need to know for your exam, okay? So in summary, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, or let me first say in summary, everything outside the brain and spinal cord is called the peripheral nervous system. Everything outside the brain and spinal cord is called the peripheral nervous system. Everything outside the brain and spinal cord is called the peripheral nervous system. I could hear somebody yell. And uh, what happens is that involves the cranial nerves. How many are there? 12 pairs. We went through those. And they basically nerves that come directly from the brain, go off those holes in the base of the skull and go to an area in the face and stuff like that. They will, and the shoulders and stuff like that. And, and the, with the vagus everywhere. Okay. I can't keep them out of anywhere. Um, and basically go, it has a, has a golden ticket anywhere it wants to go. We also have the spinal nerves. I have 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and basically they're mixed fibers, they're sensory fibers, they're motor fibers, they're autonomic fibers, and basically they're going everywhere else in the body to try to provide uh, 
uh, a nerve supply to give that signal that starts somewhere in the brain, uh, whether it be in the cerebral cortex and certain things, or uh, or in the uh, uh, the, the midbrain, uh, the the uh, pons and the medulla oblongata, wherever it starts. To, to be able to, and as well as receiving signals are coming up, sensory signals are coming up. And that's the peripheral nervous system. And that's what you should take out of this. Hopefully this is tidied up by the loose ends you have. And again, we'll be more than willing to ask, answer any questions that you might have.